All right, we can be turning to the book of Revelation. No, I did not prepare a deep message on eschatology but in times. I, <laughs> I'd like to go to the very last chapter, Revelation 22. This particular verse is a favor of the Armenians, but I don't think we should let them take it away from us. Amen. Revelation 22, verse 17. After Christ just declares part of who he is, I am the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. And then the scripture say, And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this privilege and opportunity we have together with thy people here today, Lord. I pray that you would bless in the preaching now, Lord. You might use the message to identify the saints, and you might get the glory and honor out of it. You might even save souls through it, Lord. We thank you for the singing and the teaching we've heard already this morning, Lord. I pray you just use all these things to get the glory and honor. You may be pleased in what we do and say here, Lord. We pray that you be with us. You stir us up. And do be with Brother Larry as he's traveling back. Just go with us, Lord, now. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask all these things. Amen. Well, here we have one of the whosoever will verses of the Bible. That, so the Armenians like take that and say, see, here it says whosoever will. We'll get to that here in a few minutes. But at the beginning of the verse here, it says, and the Spirit and the Bride say, come. The Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, also called the Holy Ghost, in the Old Testament, it is often referred to as the Spirit of God or the Spirit of the Lord. But he is very much God. There is some that reduce him just to an it. Some reduce him just to a the breath of God or the words of God. But he very much is a part of God. And Isaiah chapter 40 verse 13, we don't turn there, it indicates that he cannot be taught and that he cannot be directed by man. Right. John 3, 8 seems to say that he goes whithersoever he wills. Mm -hmm. He certainly is the active agent in salvation today. He is the one working in the hearts of men. As we see here, he is bidding men to Christ. John 3, verse just 5 through 7 explain how he is the one who causes people to be born again. He must be born of the Spirit. And then Christ again says, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. So the Spirit is very important today, even though we don't talk about him very often. He is the one working in and through us. He is the one that is Really sealed us until the day of redemption, Paul says. Here we see him along with the bride saying, Come. Here the bride is the bride of Christ, which we know to be the church, and as I have said before, I believe to be the faithful of the church. We use the word church collectively here, not that it's universal and invisible, but The bride is those faithful members of the Lord's local churches. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 through 25, I want to turn there, but it likens the church and Christ unto a husband and a wife. In fact, over in Acts verses 31 and 32, he says, This is a great mystery, nevertheless, I speak of Christ and the church. Well, 
Christ very much loves his bride. Mm -hmm. But oh, how he's given us something to do, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. you know, the Great Commission was given to the church. The short version is Mark 16, 15. Go ye all, go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, Matthew's gospel records the, the longer version of that. How we ought to teach and preach and baptize and do all these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. But we are to tell the world about Christ, to preach the gospel, as he says. Amen. And I think that that is really what is happening here. They are saying, come. Bidding people to Christ is what we are to do. Not try to draw them in by entertainment and by worldly schemes or by feel-good messages, but simply point them to Christ is what ought to be the main focus of the church. The Spirit of the Bride say, Come. Mm -hmm. well, there's really nowhere else to go, is there? Right. The world has lots of things to offer, but those things vanish away, don't they? They don't last. They cannot fill the spot that Christ must fill. Hear this come. There is a, a general call and there is an effectual call. Acts 17 30 says that God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That doesn't leave out anyone, does it? All men everywhere. It's not just all men in the United States, not just some men in the United States and some in the Philippines and some in China. No, it's all men everywhere. Every person born of Adam, the command is to repent, to turn from sin and turn back to God. That is man's responsibility, whether he heeds to it or not. You know, that really was the message of John the Baptist, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the message of Christ himself. In fact, he told some over in, I think it's Luke chapter 13, the, I didn't put this in my notes, but he said, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. And it's not that some need repentance and others don't. All men everywhere need to repent. But come, he says, come. No, for lack of a better way of saying it, we ought to tell people to come to Jesus. Not nothing wrong with telling them to come to church, but that ought to be to, so they can hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. But even Christ Himself in Matthew eleven twenty eight bids men to come to Him, come unto Me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. No, it's not Armenian to tell people to come to Christ. Especially if Christ himself gave the same command. But ultimately, though we know it is the Spirit that must draw men uh, to issue this effectual call, as we often call it. We'll, we'll turn over to John for a few minutes here, for a few moments. John chapter 5. John 5, verses 39 through 40. Here Christ is speaking, and he says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. So here's the problem with Armenian theology, is that man will not come to God. Man has no real desire to come to God. I mean, they have the Word of God. It's plenty available, especially in our day. It's not hard to go on the Internet and find preaching, even if it's not exactly our type of Baptist. You can hear preaching on Christ. Like I, I see in the, the mail, they get all sorts of stuff sent to, from Joel Osteen to T.D. Jakes to the Catholic Church. Search the scriptures. He says, but yet he said, You will not come to me that you might have life. 
Man has no desire to come to Christ in and of himself. Man has no natural desire to seek the things of God. So the scriptures clearly proclaim him. They clearly lay out man's condition and the solution to that, which is Christ. And yet man still seeks all sorts of other ways. Except the simple way that God has laid it out in his word. They seek to try to do good works to justify themselves. They seek to you know, join a certain type of church that they might be in good standing with God. They seek all these other things and yet they will not simply seek Christ, will they? Come to Christ and you will have life, but if you don't come to him, you can't have life. Going over to chapter 6 here in John, Christ goes even further. Verse 44, he says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. <coughs> and I will raise him up at the last day. Well, the natural man doesn't even have the ability to come to Christ and know himself, he says. He must be drawn of God. So some might say, well, why do we need to bid people to come if they will not and cannot come? And God tells us what to, that is what we are to do. Bid people to come to Christ. He will make them known. He will draw them. He will open their eyes they may see, their hearts that they may believe. No, he says, no man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, I will raise him up at the last day. And he does say in another verse here that all that come to him, he will no wise cast out. Amen. So yes, no man can come, but all that do come, Christ is going to cast out. You know, the Armenian might accuse us of saying, well, God doesn't save all who come to him, but yet he does. Any that truly come to Christ, he will save. The problem is man doesn't come to Christ. Man comes in his own terms, his own conditions. Man seeks these other ways. He says, well, God, I'm going to do all these good works and you're going to accept them. That's not God's way. Or I'm going to go to church and that will be good enough. That's not God's way. I don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved as God's way. Amen. Oh, going back to our text here in Revelation. <laughs> Even here it seems to indicate or imply this effectual call. It says in the next part, and let him that hear it. Not everyone is going to hear it. If you don't believe that, you must not have ever tried to witness or preach to somebody. If you've ever done much of any type of evangelistic work, you'll know that not all are going to hear what you have to say. They might physically hear it, but spiritually they will not hear it. There are many that go to church every Sunday, and yet they, every Sunday they leave still in the same condition. Because they have not heard. They have not had that effectual hearing, if you will. They have not had their ears open spiritually. Certainly they've heard physically. You know, 16 times throughout the scriptures, Christ says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Yeah. Or something similar to that. Not everyone has ears to hear. Even that hearing is a blessing of God. Well, if you have ears to hear, you better listen up. If you have any desire for Christ, you can be sure it's of God. What's going on in our text here? He says, let him that hear say come. So if Christ has spoken to you, God has spoken to you, you ought to tell others about Christ as well. Is that not what the Samaritan woman did in John chapter 4? The woman at the well. John 4, 28-29 tells us that after 
Christ revealed himself to her after he, she knew who he was. She left her water pots and went and told the others in the city. And it says they came out and believed also because of what she had said. If Christ has spoken to you, tell others about Christ. If you have heard spiritually, we ought to speak of, of the person of Christ. Let him that hears say, Come. That come to Christ ought to be our message. Let him that is a thirst come. This seems to echo the words of Isaiah. Isaiah 55, we can turn over there for a minute. Everyone has this thirst, if you will. The problem is they try to fill it with everything but Christ. So deep down, every man knows that there is a God. And whether they admit it or not, they realize they are accountable to God. I think that's one of the reasons why the atheists hate God so much, because they don't want to be accountable to Him. He says, everyone that thirst, come. Isaiah 55 verse 1 says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. So are you thirsty? He says, come to the waters. And notice what he says there, He that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Ye, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. It was a gift to God, it was without price, isn't it? The gift of God was paid in full by Jesus himself. Yeah. Oh, everyone that thirsteth, he says, oh, come to the waters, is the message. It was the message of Isaiah's day, it's the message in Revelation, it should be our message today, to come to the only one who can give this water. We'll turn in a moment to John chapter 4, but if you're thirsty today, don't fill it with other things. Fill it with Christ. If the world seeks to fill it with the money and possessions or jobs and families or even sometimes drugs and alcohol, with that thirst, that longing that's deep down in man, only God can fill that. All those things the world cannot satisfy. I think Solomon realized that the hard way. He tried all those different things, and he said, "All is vanity." And he came to the end of it, and he said, "Let's hear the conclusion of the matter: Fear God, and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man." Though all the things of this world will not satisfy that place which Christ can satisfy that. No amount of money, no amount of drugs and alcohol, no amount of possessions will ever truly quench that thirst. Only Christ can do that. Come each of the waters, he says, and buy without money and without price. It doesn't cost you anything physically. I mean, it will cost you in service. Really, the life of a Christian to be faithful to God is a sacrificial life. But when it comes to Christ, that doesn't cost you any money. It doesn't cost you really anything that's of any more value than Christ Himself. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him that let him take. The water of life freely. Well, here's what our means is like whosoever will, he says. Whosoever you know, desires or whosoever would. Well, like we mentioned, man has no natural desire for God. We see this over in Romans chapter 8. I'll turn there for just a moment. Romans 8, verses 7 and 8.
It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. With this carnal or fleshly mind, he says it's the enemy of God. It's against God, if you will. It has no desire to serve God. And he says, he goes on to say that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. In verse 9, we that are saved, he says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. So the natural man cannot please God. The natural man, his mind is against God. Yet man thinks he will come to God on his own. Man thinks he will do this and be pleasing to God. Yet Paul fairly plainly says they, they cannot please him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 tells us. Well, man will not come to God on his own, but he has no desire to come to God. So, whosoever will, whosoever desires, that desire must come from God. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12 says. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Verse 13 through 14 say, Which things also we speak not, well, we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. Notice verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually Discern. The natural man cannot receive the things of God. He said it says here they are foolishness unto them. I mean man tries to reason out why that God would allow sin and why he would send his son to die, how that, that could possibly do any good. The logic and reason is not the way to Christ. It is by faith and by faith alone. He says, For by grace are you saved through faith. A man tries to think, Well, I'll do good works, or I'll do this, or I'll do that, and I'll be good with God. That's not the way of God. No, he says, We have received not, reverse, reverse, for we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. It is the spirit that must reveal these things unto us. It is the Spirit that must show man his condition, that must show man his need for a Savior. Man naturally thinks he is okay, doesn't he? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good person, man says. I, if I do this or I do that, or I haven't done this and I haven't done that. Nothing else, the prayer of the Pharisee. And the prayer of the publican, I'll show you the difference in that. The Pharisee, when he thanked God, he was not as other men are, extortioners and adulterers, and even as this publican, he says. And he goes on to say, But I give tithes of all I possess, I fast twice in the week. He looked at himself and all that he had done, and all that he had not done, and all that he was and all that he wasn't, and thought he was okay with God. That is what nat the natural man does. Yet the publican just said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Yeah. That comes from the Spirit. That must be revealed unto a man. I think I wrote it somewhere, but I don't see it on my notes. John chapter 16. John 16. Okay, John 16, verse 7 and 8 say, 
Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. Yeah. For if I go not away, the Comforter, that is the Holy Spirit, will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Yeah. Notice verse 8. When he has come, he will prove, that is, to rebuke or convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. For it is the Spirit which convicts men of sin. Mm -hmm. well, I know, going back to my own salvation, I thought I was okay. I was a you know, pretty good kid. I didn't do anything bad. Yet the Spirit showed me that I needed a Savior. I think the rest of us could say something similar. The Spirit shows us our condition. The Spirit shows man what he is and what he needs. Man has not come to that conclusion on his own. No, in fact, I forget where it's at, but Christ tells a parable of a man who tries to come in and clean up his house. And I think says, we leave seven more spirits more wicked than the previous come in. That's what the natural man does. He tries to come in and clean up himself, and he leaves out in a worse condition than he was before. Sure. No, whosoever will, that will comes from God. That desire comes from God, not from anything within the natural man. As we know, Ephesians 2, verse 1 tells us that we were dead in trespassing and sins. So I, I haven't dug up a dead body and asked them, but I'm pretty sure if you went out there in a graveyard mm -hmm. and asked them anything, they wouldn't have any desire, would they? they can't, you can't have any desire, he's dead. Any desire spiritually that man has has to come from God Himself. If you have any desire for Christ, be sure it's of God. Let's go to the last point of our text here. We'll wrap up. Back in Revelation 22. <clears throat> it says, And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Here we see it again. This water of life is free. It doesn't cost you anything to take of the water of life. No, you don't have to offer up money like Simon the sorcerer did. In fact, Peter told him, thy money perish with thee. You. you don't have to offer up good works. Well, you can be as poor as can be spiritually. In fact, you are if you're not saved. Yet the water of life is free to all that, all that will come. Let's turn over to John chapter 4, and we'll close the woman at the well here. John chapter 4. Here Christ offers her this living water just the same. Well, I had the thought if you ever think the natural man will choose Christ and just look at the Jews when they had Christ there before Pilate. They had the choice of Jesus or Barabbas, the Prince of Life or the Savior over a, a sinner, a murderer. Brother Junior mentioned that in Sunday school lesson. And yet, who did they choose? They didn't choose Christ. They didn't choose the Savior. They chose was Barabbas. Well, John chapter 4, verse number 5. It says, Then cometh he as Jesus to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said, saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. We see first here, in verse 6, the, really the humanity, if you will, of Christ. How he was weary from his journey, and he sat with us on the well, it says. Then we see 
Also, like, he was not modern term discriminatory, was he? The Jews, they turned away from the Samaritans. They thought the Samaritans were half breeds that they were not good enough to even speak to. This woman was caught off guard here when he says, give me to drink. He says, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, who it is that saith to thee, Give me a drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Here we see this living water again. Christ offers living water to all who would have it. But here is the problem. Notice what he says first in that verse, If thou knewest the gift of God, who it is that saith to thee, the natural man doesn't understand Christ or the gift of God. She was literally talking to Christ himself and she didn't even know who he was. She was, I mean, he was offering her, or he could offer her, I guess you could say, the, this living water, this eternal life, and yet she had no clue. So if thou knewest the gift of God, who it is that saith thee, give me a drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The Christ does not turn away any that come to him. All that come to me, I will no wise cast out, he says. So I don't think it's wrong, if you will, it's to point others to Christ, let's tell them to come to Christ. So he says he will give them this living water. Verse 11, the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, from whence then hast thou that living water. And once again, logic and reason will not lead you to Christ. She was, I mean, she was thinking reasonably for what she could understand. <laughs> well, there's a well here, and he's offering me this water, but he has no way to get it out. So how's this going to work? Natural man doesn't comprehend the things of God. Nicodemus was the same way. When Christ told him he must be born again, well, how can I enter again the second time when mother's woman will be born? The natural man will not understand these things. He will reason them out, try to figure it out by logic. He will try to come up with some physical explanation, but yet, only faith is the only way to explain it. Verse 12 says, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Oh, he was far greater than Jacob, wasn't he? He was far greater than even Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am. That made the Jews pretty mad. Oh, he's greater than Jacob and Isaac and Abraham. For he was the God of Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. Verse 13 says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again. Speaking of the physical water. But so it is with the things of this world. If you drink of those things, you'll thirst again. <laughs> Money might satisfy for a little while, but then you'll get thirsty again. Drugs and alcohol may soothe you over for a little while, and then you'll get thirsty again. No, nothing this world can offer will ever quench that thirst which you have. Notice verse 14. But whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. This, this water, he says, it's a well springing up in everlasting life. Christ gives eternal life. He doesn't give life and then you can, you can vanish away. You know, he says that whosoever drinks of this water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. That doesn't mean one day they'll thirst again. No. Christ offers an eternal thirst quencher, if you will, in this living water. But it can't be God from any other way, can it? It can only be from Christ. 
So come, come to the waters, and take a little water of life freely, ought to be our message. I'm going to read one verse for us in John 7. You know, if you know the rest of the story of the Samaritan there, he reveals himself to her, and she goes and tells the others about him. John 7, verse 37 through 39. I guess I need to get to the right chapter. <laughs> it says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Over well, here, once again, we see the same message. Come to Christ and drink. Come to Christ and take of this living water. Verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That was verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. My thinking on this is that he, this water is the Holy Spirit. And it shall be, as he says, a well springing up in everlasting life. Or as it says here, his belly shall flow with rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit's not a well that's going to dry up one day. No, the, this fountain, if you will, is well of living water will go on through all eternity. It's not, you don't have to worry about it going dry or <laughs> turning bad on you. No, it will be good for all eternity. Well, our message ought to be just to come and take of the water of life freely. Not add or take anything away from that. We don't need to add church membership or good works. We don't need to take away from it either and just say, well, just do whatever you want. You'll be all right. We'll come to Christ and Christ alone. Uh, like I said, I know that man cannot and will not come of his own self, but yet we are bidden into Christ and let God Specifically, the Holy Spirit do the work of drawing and converting. So come to the waters if you don't know Christ. Take of this water of life freely. Drink of this water which can quench your thirst for all of eternity. For all their drinks will fail you. All their drinks will cause you to thirst again. 